Don't Tell start without yourself. Yeah. Uh, I have a somewhat unusual background. I started with a PhD in nuclear physics, but was never able to turn that into employment. And so through a variety of random walks, I ended up in the new medical school at McMaster um, doing research in medical education, pretty well unqualified to do so. Mm -hmm. But um, over time, I've learned a few of the tricks of the trade, and over the last few years, I've managed to call myself a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> so nuclear physics, that was, that's quite a step. Uh, yeah, it was an easy step towards things like measurement and mm -hmm. statistics because you had to know a little bit of mathematics to do physics. Mm -hmm. But learning how to be a, a decent psychologist and do decent research in psychology did take an awful lot longer and took a few very good mentors like my dear colleague Lee Brooks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So part of the, the research that, um, that you do and that um, I suppose in medical education that, it, that a lot of what it's based on is, is categorization, is diagnoses. Um, how, do, how do people generally diagnose? I mean, it's really kind of a categorization problem, isn't it? So yeah, what, 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 is, what is categorization more generally and, and how, do people, how do people do it? Well, before we get there, let me back up a second and give you an idea as to how we got into this mess. Mm -hmm. um, I was originally hired to look at clinical problem solving, and the idea was the diagnosis was not a categorization task. Mm -hmm. It was really a matter of some kind of problem solving skill. And our initial quest was to go after some kind of general skills that people acquired as they became experts. Mm -hmm. What emerged even back then in the late 70s was that in fact the general skill really wasn't very general. At one level, it was too general and that everybody did it the same mm -hmm. so that it didn't discriminate experts from novices. At another level, it was too specific because success on one problem had very little to do with success on the next problem. Right. That led to thinking about, well, maybe this isn't the way to characterize it at all. And yes, you're absolutely right. Diagnosis is a form of categorization. And I think for me personally, the breakthrough was to work with people at McMaster who were really into what's called concept formation or categorization. Mm -hmm. And some of the models about everyday categorization really had enormous power in explaining medical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So to go back to your initial question, historically psychologists have been interested in categorization because it's the basis of communication. I can't talk about a tree or a dog or a cat or a butterfly unless I have some senses and you have the same sense as to what the term butterfly stands for. Mm -hmm. And so categorization, I think, has a long history in psychology. I think it's fair to say that initially the thinking was that there must be some implicit rules that governed each category, but a moment's reflection on, say, a beanbag chair mm -hmm. tells you that the implicit rules of chairs are unlikely to be necessary and sufficient. Right. So <coughs> what makes a chair a chair is normally someone would think uh, four legs, maybe wooden chair, but that, that sort of rule might not be all-encompassing, it might not define what, what everyone means by a chair, I suppose. No rule will encompass what everyone means by every kind of chair because you have to consider all sorts of possible legs, including yeah. none, none at all. Yeah. Or um, cats or dogs. Or cats or, or dogs and so on. I mean, cats includes everything from house cats to lions and dogs include everything from chihuahuas to mastiffs. Mm -hmm. And to come up with any general rule simply doesn't happen. Hmm. The two more prevalent views, one is that essentially we average our experiences into a prototype and that prototypes are distinguished as having more of the features of the category and fewer of the features of other categories so we can play experimental games and find that a carrot is the prototypical vegetable and a robin is the prototypical bird mm -hmm. and penguins because they don't look like, because they don't fly and they don't have feathers are, are very atypical. Mm -hmm. So the older view is the prototype view that essentially our experience gets averaged into internal prototypes. Mm -hmm. A more recent view, and one which seems to play out really, really well in medical diagnosis, is what's called the exemplar view, that essentially says, as you walk around the world, you gather examples. And every natural category, as you learn, you acquire examples. Mm -hmm. And the, the act of conversation or the act of diagnosis ultimately amounts to matching the incoming information with some prior example in, in memory that has many of the characteristics uniquely of the, uh, of the new stimulus. Mm -hmm. So applying that to dogs and cats, for example, if I'm trying to recognize a beast that's running toward me, it's probably not going to be on the basis of uh, a prototypical dog or a cat, but instead uh, on the basis of the previous examples of dogs and cats that I've encountered before? Sure. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Glenn Regeer actually has a very nice example of that. He says, suppose you grow up in the Yukon and all you see is huskies. How many chihuahuas do you have to see before you recognize a chihuahua, <laughs> chihuahua as a dog? And the answer is one. <laughs> and in yeah. fact, I, I, I have a talk about this whole issue of medical diagnosis. And one of, the, one of the key features and the one that grabs the audience inevitably is the video of my year and a half old daughter where we show her playing the Fisher-Price uh, toy with dogs and cats and B.S. Skinner would be happy as can be because what she's learned is that if she puts that thing in that slot then mommy gives her a popsicle and tells her how wonderful she is. Mm -hmm. But then we show her this, uh, an adult magazine, a house and garden magazine which contains a bunch of photographs and two of them have dogs in them and she points to the two dogs. Hmm. And what's interesting about that is that she can't say dog. Right. She's a year and a half old. She's preliterate. Yep. She can't say dog. It is implausible that she would have a rule for dog. Yep. And yet she can classify dogs already from what amounts to a fairly limited experience. Now, mm -hmm. Probably helps that she has a family dog and they go to the dog park every day. Mm -hmm. So she's got a few examples and that's all she needs to get by. Yep. So it only takes just a few <coughs> examples to be able to get the job done. It seems so, yeah. yeah. Obviously, I mean, the, the mystery would be what exactly is that similar, similarity mm -hmm. matching? How does that come about? And I think then you can invoke more fundamental models of the nature of memory, which is associationist or connectionist, mm -hmm. which basically says that we are somehow in a very rapid and unconscious way matching on individual attributes and, and seeking connections that way. Mm -hmm. That's far too basic science and psychology for me to play with, but that's, I think, a pretty decent model. Yeah. And so what about your doctors? So when, we're, when we go from everyday classification or or categories like dogs and cats and tables and chairs uh, and you only need just a few exemplars to be able to get the job done. Do, do docs work the same way? So if you're learning about skin lesions or mental disorders or um, more complex types of categories, is it just take um, a few exemplars there as well? Well, clearly medical diagnosis is a bit more complex in part because the Yes, for skin lesions, we can imagine a picture that's kind of like looking at a picture of a dog, but for something like multiple sclerosis, mm -hmm. it's much more abstract than that. Secondly, self-evidently, the stakes are higher. Right. Uh, we don't want to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so what you see coming about in the clinical encounter is what has been called since the 1970s the hypothetical deductive method, which is within a few minutes or maybe even seconds, we don't know the time scale, a physician will... Uh, advance a number of hypotheses as to what the diagnosis will likely be. And then we'll go on a systematic search to gather information, by and large, to confirm one or another diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Clearly, what differentiates the expert from the novice is not how many hypotheses or how early, but what are the hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And expertise resides entirely in generating better hypotheses. Hmm. Um, even going back to our original studies in the 70s, we found that that early hypothesis generation was enormously powerful. Basically, if you thought of the right diagnosis in the first five minutes, your chances of getting there was 95%. If you didn't, your chances were 20%. Wow. Yeah. And that then leads to the fundamental question that's kept me interested all these years. Uh -huh. Where do those hypotheses come from? Right. And exemplar models are a very powerful way of thinking about that. Sure. That essentially prior experience is available to you. And so the idea then is that you, throughout your career as a diagnostician, you're accumulating experiences of the sort, yeah. like lichen planus or, or particular skin lesions, and you develop a bunch of those experiences yeah. enough to be able to categorize new ones yeah. efficiently without any conscious effort? Yes, yeah. certainly in something like dermatology, we've actually documented that if a dermatologist looking at a skin lesion, if he gets it right, it takes him eight seconds. Wow. There's not a lot of room for analytical processing in that process. Um, one of the, a couple of games I play with clinician audiences quite often, one is to ask them how long after you graduated before you felt you were competent. Mm -hmm. Now to the average person on the street, you'd think that would be ruled out of order from the outset. They're competent when we graduated them, aren't they? Right. And the answer is no. Mm. And the answer is routinely five years post-graduation. You put that with five years of training mm. and then you say the 10 years and 10,000 hours that everybody's, that's now become common street talk. Yep. The second thing that's really intrigued me to illustrate the power of this method is, is the diagnosis of sick. Mm. Now, the emergency physicians are preoccupied with the diagnosis of sick. 
this preeminent skill in the emergency department is to be able to tell the sick ones from the not so sick ones. Right. And yet there's no textbook that has a chapter on how to diagnose sick. <laughs> <laughs> there That's are right. no signs and symptoms of sick. Yeah. You might be too blue or too red, you might be too hot or too cold, your pulse may be too high or too low, your blood pressure may be too high or too low, and on and on mm -hmm. and on. Mm -hmm. There are a number of conditions that, that run to pages that are all considered sick conditions. Yep. But a very recent study actually just published this year showed that you turn to the emergency doc and say, is this one sick or not? Mm -hmm. And he makes a judgment in seconds. And that has about an 85% accuracy in terms of predicting whether ultimately when they get to the wards, they end up with a very serious diagnosis. Hmm. The doc, with his experience, can recognize sick from a mile away. So you mentioned that uh, the process of categorization and diagnosis and so on is, is fast and accurate. We can do it very quickly. Um, is that all there is? I mean, there seems like, as doctors, it seems that they should be able to, I mean, that's what they do in medical school, isn't it, is, is learn the rules and, and they're, they're very careful and, and deliberative in coming up with these diagnoses. Sure, I think in every clinical encounter, there's really two fairly distinct phases. The initial phase of hypothesis generation, which is so effortless, it just seems to be too easy. And then a second confirmation phase where they go back to the rules, the 29 causes of anemia, the signs and symptoms of pernicious anemia and so forth, just to confirm that that's what they're dealing with. Now, because it seems so effortless, that first phase is often called just pattern recognition and it's kind of denigrated. It's, hmm. People sort of think, of, you know, you're not really doing your work, you're not working hard enough. And in fact, that whole idea that 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 first system, and it's called a dual processing model, then that's called system one. That that rapid generation of hypotheses, there's a kind of a prevailing wisdom that, that that's bad, that that leads to errors, and that what we should do is teach people analytical processes to, to correct those errors, and that the second phase is actually the fundamental phase in terms of reducing errors. Mm -hmm. This has been popularized a lot by a guy named Kahneman, who's got a Nobel Prize psychologist. Uh, he's written a book that I think many people know. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for at least a year called Thinking Fast and Slow. His claim is just that, that essentially fast thinking, system one thinking, leads to errors and that we should be cautioning people, doctors and everyone else, to be more slow, rational, thoughtful, and that that would reduce the errors that happen in human judgments. Mm -hmm. I happen to believe that's wrong, and I've accumulated a, num a bunch of evidence to suggest that indeed that's wrong. We encourage one group of physicians working through cases to go fast. We encourage a second group to go slow and take their time. We find that the group that goes slower indeed takes longer on each case, but study after study has shown that the accuracy is exactly the same in both groups. Mm -hmm. So the notion simply by slowing down and being thoughtful and analytical, you'll solve the problem and, and the errors will go away it seems to me simplistic at best. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think we should. Wait what just a second that for noise? that high pitch. There we go. <laughs> so if the goal then is um, for accurate judgments, I mean, we see this across a few fields where um, the ideal is to slow down, take your time, make sure that you're doing it correctly. Yeah. Um, it seems fairly counterintuitive that that would actually, that wouldn't be as good uh, as making a rapid judgment, as uh, that the fast sort of judgment that diagnosticians are making are as accurate as diagnosticians or decision makers who take their time. Is that really? I mean, is that? Yeah, it's almost like there's a chicken and egg thing. If I ask you, what's 12 times 12? Mm -hmm. The answer is 144. Yeah. It's rapid and it's accurate. If I ask you, what's 17 times 17? The answer is, I don't know, but I guess I can work it out. The answer is actually 289, by the way. Only mm -hmm. statisticians seem to know that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an example where the slow process is actually more error prone than the fast process. Mm -hmm. It seems, I agree, and in fact, the, I think it's safe to say that the majority view is that the slow process is going to be ultimately higher benefit in the long run, but that's against the evidence. Mm -hmm. This has really been captured in medicine where a book called The Reflective Practitioner by a, a guy named Schoen was published probably 10 years ago and argued basically that if every physician learned to be reflective in the course of their process and at the end of the day looking back on things that, that the world would be a better place. It plays out particularly well in health professions because like any professional they are basically autonomous. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. They have clients, they make very serious decisions about those clients, and they have no peers in general looking over their shoulder to see whether they're right or wrong. Mm -hmm. So it, there is undoubtedly a need for, for practitioners or any kind of professional to keep up, to recognize their strengths and weaknesses. Mm. The notion, therefore, that reflection, being able to reflect on your process, is somehow going to achieve that, mm -hmm. has real cachet. Sure. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a shred of evidence. All right. If so, anything, the opposite. Are, are people good at assessing their own ability? I mean, it is, there's, I've read a little bit in, in the field. A, a colleague of ours, Kevin Eva, has done some work on, on the role of self-assessment. And it seems, at least given his preliminary work, that, uh, that we're not very good at it. That is, we don't seem to be, um, we don't seem to be very good at assessing how well we can do various things. Is that, is that right? You've published it's a not, There's them. nothing preliminary about it. Kevin should be here to speak to it, but I think I can pretty well paraphrase what Kevin would say. Yep. In fact, I'll be more blunt than Kevin ever would. <laughs> Self-assessment sucks. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, I think the evidence is utterly overwhelming that okay. people can't self-assess their way out of the paper bag. Sure. In fact, Kevin has a nice demonstration of this. If I think of all the people who are watching this video, I'm going to ask them all a simple question. Are you in the bottom half of driving skills? Hmm. Now, half of you should say yes, <laughs> but having seen this, but perform, having done this in live time, probably one out of 100 will say yes. And right. yet half of you, by definition, are in the bottom half of driving skills. Right. The evidence is absolutely crushing that hmm. people cannot assess where they're at. They basically start with the pre premise that they're at about 70% and then go up and down from there. Hmm. You're better than I am, but I'm about 70%, so you must be 80%. Yeah. It was captured by a, a psychologist whose name I sadly forget, but he said it so beautifully. He said, how can I know what I don't know when I don't know what I don't know? Right. And it's that simple. You have no way of judging what the universe of that, of that domain is. Mm -hmm. And so your only guess is to say, I guess I got 70% of it. Even experts? Experts, of course, are the exception because they do know the domain. Hmm. Now, at some level, no, the experts fail too. But in terms of judging your overall knowledge base, yeah, the people who know it all are the ones who can accurately determine that they know it all. Right. But that doesn't help an expert judging his own performance on a, on a specific case, for example. We have some evidence, yes, actually we have a fair amount of evidence in medicine that physicians perform better than chance, and the more expert you are, the better you perform. But still, their hit rate in terms of I'm confident in this diagnosis versus I turn out to be accurate in this diagnosis is probably about 60%. Hmm. They're far from perfect. Wow. But they're better, from, better than chance, but far from perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So how do they improve? As, a, as an expert, um, you mentioned that we, uh, going slow doesn't necessarily help. Um, being deliberative, um, and there's this uh, compounded issue of, of self-assessment that we often don't know how good we're actually doing in any given case? I mean, what does that mean for improving practice? How do we get better? How do we, um, the, the goal of this course that we're taking is called the science of everyday thinking. Uh, so given your experience um, in, in the field of expertise and in medicine, how do we improve everyday thinking? You improve by knowing more. <laughs> <laughs> so just the accumulation of experiences. Yeah, it seems so tantalizing. It would be really nice if I could be very prescriptive and say, well, if you do this, that, and the other thing, then you'll be much better. At some level, I guess there's got to be a bit of a germ of truth in that. I mean, this course wouldn't exist if we didn't think that there's some that being explicit about everyday thinking and the, the, the traps in everyday thinking wouldn't help people think better. And, and at some level, that's true, but that's generally locking into what's been called general problem-solving strategies, which are not very powerful. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's going to help a bit. Um, I suppose reflection is going to help a little bit. But it seems that all of these strategies, to sort of generalize hor horrendously, are good for about a 10% improvement. Okay. Uh, it's not zero, but yeah. it's not night and day or black and white either. Mm -hmm. And very clearly, the single best predictor of how good you are is how much you know about the domain, not what problem-solving skills you bring to bear on it. We began there, that was wrong. Yeah, and so then would you suggest in, in getting more experience and gaining and kind of accumulating uh, knowledge, 
Uh, is it just a matter of studying the domain more, of getting more experience? So if I'm a, if I'm a novice diagnostician, in order to become an expert, in order to become uh, an expert in the true sense, is it just a matter of uh, working hard and studying the rules and getting as much exposure to a, a wide variety of, of examples within that domain? Yes, we can, but we can do better than that. This really segues into a whole other branch of educational psychology. Mm -hmm. The question is, are there strategies we can do to optimize the acquisition of knowledge? Yep. And again, we're talking about two kinds of knowledge, formal knowledge and experiential knowledge. Yep. And we're now beginning to discover, and I can't take any personal credit for this one, this isn't my domain, but people like Mayer, Bjork, Rodiger have been working hard on taking models of the nature of, of the mind, mm -hmm. short-term working memory, long-term memory associative, and turning that into very prescriptive and powerful strategies to enhance the efficiency of learning. Right. Uh, things like an obvious thing like mixing up the, the examples from across multiple chapters so that you have to try and figure out which is which. Mm -hmm. It turns out to be an extremely powerful strategy for learning. Yep. The idea of transfer, which is being able to take knowledge that you've learned in one context and apply it to another. Yep. One, it doesn't happen at all as easily as we think it does. But two, psychologists have devised strategies to make that happen better. Mm -hmm. So I think this is moving much more into the instructional educational psychology end of things. Mm -hmm. There are things we can do to very much enhance the efficiency with which you acquire the knowledge you need to get the job done as a, as a diagnostician or as a human. All right. Well, thanks, Jeff. That's I appreciate a good one your to time. finish. Human. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go away. <laughs> My name is Jeff. I think about reasoning. Mm -hmm.